So here we've got the content pyramid. Now this idea I came across maybe 10 years ago, and it's really just repurposing content, right? That's the basic principle behind it. Essentially, we have something that we've created that takes time to create. So a video or a podcast or something high level that there's a lot of input, a lot of editing. So that's going to be our high level content piece. Then we're going to repurpose that into a blog article or an email. And then from there, we'll repurpose it into social media posts for all of our different channels. Now, the social media posts and the emails, we can create as many of those as we like so that we have this constant feed of posts and alerts. But the problem with this idea 10 years ago was that it involved a lot of moving parts and a lot of people. It was fairly easy to create a video. And then from there, you would have to hire a blog post writer or a content writer to create the blog, to write the email. Then you'd most likely hire a couple of different social media people to create those social media posts, create the images to go with the posts, all of that sort of stuff. And it just involved a lot of moving parts, a lot of people doing separate things, a lot of checking off that things were done correctly, scheduling them out to different systems, etc. And it just took a lot of time, right? So I never implemented this for my business. I knew how powerful it was, but it was very hard to implement. And now we've got Loom which is essentially a free screen recording software. That's what I use for all these videos. 10 bucks a month, you can do unlimited recording. And it also does automatic transcriptions, which is what is important here. Then you've also got YouTube that you can upload your videos to, and you can get a very rough transcription once that's uploaded there. Now, the idea here is that we've got ChatGPT, and with ChatGPT, we can use that to write our blog posts and our social media posts. However, how most people use ChatGPT is they prompt it. They put in a prompt like, write me a social media post or a blog post about the five best reasons to use make.com, right? And it will spit out something that's fairly generic, sounds like an AI bot that wrote it. However, when we repurpose our content, we have this big audio or video transcription and we feed that into ChatGPT and now it's got our own personal tone, our own words that we use whilst we're talking. It has what we've talked about, the things that we think are important. ChatGPT can then synthesize all of this and sift it and summarize it and then use that to create the content. And when we do content creation this way, we create highly unique content very quickly, very affordably, that's personalized to our brand and we leverage our time and leverage our resources. So here's the basic structure. And from here, we essentially create our video post. We then extract the transcript from somewhere. Now, if you're using Loom, then we can just simply go to loom.com and every single video will have the transcription on the right of the video. So here we've got the video, then we just go to transcript and we can just copy out this transcription here. Now, once we've got the transcription, we feed that into ChatGPT with a fairly simple prompt where we're just giving it the tonality, we're giving it some parameters of this is an email, I want it for three to 500 words, etc., And then we'll get the output from ChatGPT. If we've got that big chunk of text, ChatGPT can then randomize what it selects out of that text to then create some nice random social media posts each time we click run, right? Each time we say create a new post, it will then sift through a thousand, two thousand words and pull out something that it thinks is useful and relevant. Uh, rather than if we just had a quick sort of five to 10 dot points, it's a little bit less um, data for ChatGPT to work with. So it's going to be a little bit more restricted in the output than it will create. So that's the basic structure. Now let's jump into how we build that in bubble and make.com. So here we've got the first video that I recorded talking about that content pyramid overview. So let's use that to create our uh, metadata for the video to post it onto YouTube and then to also create the social media posts, emails and blogs, etc. Here we've got the video and I'm in Loom. I'm going to copy the transcription here and I want the whole transcription. So I'll take that across into my video platform now here I'm just using Bubble to build a very basic sort of video management tool, just a list here of all the videos that I'm working on. And then here I've got my content pyramid video. Now 
You could use any tool for this. You can use Airtable, ClickUp, Monday.com. I prefer Bubble because I can really just customize everything in here and build it to whatever I want. And I'm not limited to anything. Now in here, I've got the transcription here and I'll paste in my transcription there. I can then click my generate meta button. And what that does is it just sends a webhook across to make and that webhook then processes the data in ChatGPT. So let's go through this scenario here. Now, here we've got our webhook and how that is connected from Bubble is we've got our here API connector and then we've got our make API here. And then I've just got generate YouTube meta is a API call that I've added. And then I've got my hook here, which I can send data to and a parameter of ID. Now, when I send data to that webhook, what happens is it will then run this scenario. And the only thing I need to send is the video. Then I look up the video content and I get the data for that. Now, how I structure databases in Bubble is I use what's called data siloing. And I highly recommend this, even if you're using something like Airtable or Monday or ClickUp, it just speeds things up a lot if you use data siloing. So I'll cover that in a separate concept, in a separate video, but essentially it's, we create a lightweight object, which is what we return when we just want to see what we've got in the database. And then once we know what we want to look at, we have a detail object or several detail sort of compartments in that object. And we can then call each compartment or whichever compartment makes sense to get the information for. And that has all of our heavy information, like long text strings, images, lots and lots of fields, etc. Here I've got my video, then I get my detail. The detail is where I keep that transcription because that's a heavy data. And then here I'm setting the tone. I like to set the tone in a variable. For now, this is fine. I might extend this tone a little bit more, make it a little bit more specific, but the output seems to be okay from that. Then I'm doing a call to ChatGPT here. And how I've structured this call is I've got my system prompt. You are a YouTube SEO expert. Write a title and description for this transcript. So I'm telling it that I'm giving it a transcript. Don't use any special characters. That's because of a limitation in YouTube. Uh, and also if I'm sending the data via um, API, JSON can be a bit funny with special characters. Uh, do use emojis in the description. Then I'm telling it to return a JSON instead of just the result. Now, I prefer it to always return JSON because it gives me structured data as the output, which means rather than having two or three of these modules where I maybe do one module where I say, produce the title, another where I ask it to chapter it, I could do it that way and just take the result from each one. But the problem there is quite often it will surround the result with like double quotation marks or it will put like a, here is the title colon and then the title. It will give very messy data. If we tell it to use JSON, it gives very clean data because it doesn't put any of that sort of fluff around the answer that I want. So I always prefer to do this when I do the call. Then I'm sending it the transcript. I've got fairly high token limit here because the transcriptions could be quite long. The temperature I've just turned down a little bit just to make it a little bit less robotic when it creates. the. And then here I'm setting the response format to JSON object. Now you need to do that if you're going to set the result that you want as JSON. If you leave it as text, well then it, it will unreliably give you JSON as the result. So here we've got the result that we used, 1800 tokens all up, so not too bad. And then we've got our result here, master, da, da, da. that looks pretty good for a YouTube title. And in the description, it did use emojis here, which is nice. It did do chaptering, which is good. And it's got the correct timestamps there for YouTube, correct structure. So I'm happy with the output there. Um, and I quite like the description. I think that's nice and short. Yeah, that looks fine. And then at the end of this description for my videos, I just have a, a standard sort of block that I add to the bottom of the videos, for like affiliate links, etc. And so I'll just add that on the end. So now we're just writing that back to Bubble. And I'm just doing a map to the field name, mapping in the description, keeping in mind that I've got the description on the siloed detailed video data, and then the title goes on the searchable video data. And again, that's to keep the searchable data nice and lightweight, so the searches are nice and fast, and the app goes quickly. So that's what we're mapping over there. So now if we go back to our 
video, we can see, well, we've got the title here, and then we've got the description there, and then we've got the chapters. Nice and clean. So that looks good there. Now, in this particular system, we've also got a way for us to just upload a thumbnail, and then we can update the thumbnail, update the description and the title right from here. We don't have to go to YouTube. So I've done all that with API calls with bubble.io. If you want to learn more about that, let me know and I'll break those down and how they all work because they're quite complex. The YouTube API is not the simplest thing to work with, but for me, it's worthwhile. So here we've got all the data. So that's ready now to be processed and approved by me. Normally my VA would do this for me. And uh, then from there, I'll just check this and make sure it's all okay. So we've got step one done. Now let's break it into the uh, social media posts, email, and the blog as well. Now I want to promote the video, so I'll, I'll create a, an email here. I've just built a very basic page here in Bubble, just simply a list of emails, and I've just got a simple status grouping here, draft scheduled sent. And here I'm just gonna add a video, and then I've got two options here in how the logic works. One, I can write idea here on the left, or I can select my video. And here we'll just select the video, which was Content Pyramid. And now I've selected the video, I can send this across to another webhook in mate.com. This one here is to generate the email. How this works is it will send the same data across. This time it's sending an ID of an email across. Same sort of idea though, we just send the ID. Then we look up the email. I prefer it to, to do it this way because I like to keep the webhook nice and lightweight. I don't like to weigh it down with a whole bunch of data, like a whole transcript, for instance. And the reason for that is because you've got data limits in make and you've also got um, sort of rate limits and things. And that way I can just, whenever I want to retest it, put the webhook URL in the um, web browser here and just click enter and it will rerun the make scenario. Nice little trick there. So here we're getting the email for the one that we want to produce. Then I've got a branching up the top here. Now this is where the branching comes in for whether I've got the idea or an actual video. So if I'd had something in the idea section here and I didn't have a video linked, then the logic would go down and it would put into a variable the actual idea of what I want to talk about in the email. But because I've got a video, it's going to look up the video, look up the detail to get the transcript, and then it will save the transcript as my input value. So essentially it just switches either the video transcript or the idea is the input. Then I've got the input and then the tone. Here I'm looking for helping, helpful, happy, punchy, Spartan, superhuman. And then I feed all that into ChatGPT again. And here we've got the data going in. The prompt is, you are an email marketing expert writing an email. The email body is 300 words. I like to have short emails for my list. I find long emails don't work that well for business owners. Don't have enough time to read them. You use first name. I want to just specify that if it's going to use a first name for the user, I want it to be something that I can search and find to replace it with the actual parameter. Now, the special characters there, normally it's got like a bracket and that bracket's used in JSON it would break the JSON, right, with those special characters. It'd have to be escaped, and then it just gets messy. So I find it easier just to tell it to use all caps, and then I can just simply replace those on my end. So the reason I've got that little bit of text is I've got quite a lot of transcripts, old videos, where they were done on the old Integromat platform, and so I'm just telling it to update it to make.com, and then I'm telling it to do the same return in JSON format in subject body format. Okay, so then let's look at the actual output. So unlock the power of repurposing your content. Da -da 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 -da. That looks pretty good as the output there. And then it just does the same sort of logic of sending this back to Bubble, where we're just mapping it back to our email and then our email detail. And you can see I've got the same siloing here where I've got the subject of the email and then I'm siloing off the actual body of the email as a separate data. And that, that's really important for Bubble to do the structuring that way. But even in, if you're using Airtable or ClickUp, it does help to structure the database when you've got heavy data. So that's our data there. And you can see it comes back into here. And that's roughly what it looks like in the email. And then from here, I'll just simply copy this out, paste that into my email template and edit it, change it a little bit, and then send it off, schedule it.
I put in my schedule date here and I put in the ID of the email here. And the benefit there is that I put the ID from the email into here. And then I've got another make scenario that watches or checks my email provider and that checks it once a week to then get the stats for all the emails that are sent in the last week, right? Now, the timing on that, for me, I only really care about the last week. Most people open or delete or mark the email as spam within a couple of days of sending it. So seven to 10 days is fine for me checking that data. So having the ID there lets me get all that information. And then from here, I can then create like open rate, send rate, click rate uh, data. And over time, I can then see, okay, well here I used the tones of XYZ to create this email. And the open rates for those tones were 20%. For these tones, the open rate was 22%. So, you know, these tones are better, right? Because maybe a humorous type subject line is better than an informative subject line for my audience. So allowing me to sort of get all the stats put into the data structure here and also storing the data of like what tones were used, for instance, that would allow me to optimize the system. Now, currently we're not storing the tones in here. That's an improvement I would look to add later on. Currently, they're just written hard in here, but I could store the tones on the email and even have them as an option set that I select. Rather than the variable, I would just look up the data from the email and then map that into this here. I could even do a pivot table of the tones versus the open rates and do an average open rate per tone. You might find that the subject line needs to be in a certain tone and the actual body needs to be in a different tone. So that might change over time. Now to see if the body is effective, you'd be looking at the click rate. Open rate is the subject line. That's what gets people to open. And then the click rate is the actual body. People read the body of the email and then they click the link. So make sure that you're optimizing if you're gonna set that system up. Optimize for the right metric. And then obviously spam, that'd probably be mostly the subject line, I'd say would be spam because it's really the sender that most people are, are spamming. So if you're sending to a list that's not segmented correctly, well, then you might get a lot of spam complaints. For instance, my list, I have a lot of active campaign users. Those users are not interested in make or bubble, right? But the majority of make users are interested in bubble and pretty much all the bubble users are interested in make, right? So I know that I'm safe to send to certain segments uh, topics. Okay, so that is the email generation. And then from here, I can then schedule that out and build it in my email system. Okay, so same layout here. I've got my list of social posts. Uh, and then I can create a new post, add it to certain channels, uh, set the draft, etc. Here, I would bring in the data for my pyramid video. And I get my nice little preview of the video here. It's not on YouTube yet, so that preview doesn't load. But once it's posted on YouTube, then the ID would exist and then I could watch the video right here in the app rather than having to go to YouTube. What I've done here is the buttons within Bubble, um, certain buttons for these webhooks, they're only clickable if the data exists that is required for the webhook. And you can see how quickly it created that social post as well within like two seconds, right? Created the long form and the short form post. So I've got these, if I didn't have a video here, the button would be not clickable. And that's just a little bit of help the end user so that they can't send data to a webhook without the data existing in the database. The button becomes clickable when the video is linked or when there's an idea text. As long as there's some text in the idea field or the video is linked, then I can generate the social post. Then I've added a couple of copy link buttons here. And what this allows me to do is just copy it and then go across to buffer where I schedule out these posts and then I can format it a little bit better, add in some emojis, et cetera, and select the media that's gonna be featured in the post. Now we've got the same trigger here where we're sending in a webhook and we're just sending the ID, then we're pulling up the social post. Then for the social post, we've got the same sort of logic of if the video is not empty, then we get the video, get the transcription, write the transcription into our variable. And if the video is empty, then we just simply use the idea for the social post. That allows me a little bit of flexibility so that if I want to just do a post that doesn't have a video, well, I can, and it will just default to the idea instead of the transcription. 
Then again, I've pulled out the tone here, intriguing, engaging, Spartan tone. And you can play around with those tones. It's just something that I think works all right. And then the prompt is social media expert, write a short informative post in this tone, return a short post for Twitter, a long post for Facebook, use this JSON structure. Now, a little improvement here. I noticed that it didn't use any emojis in this. And so I'm going to just say use emojis. Okay. And then I, I just like to clean up the structure a little bit just to make it a little bit easier for me to read. I'm sure we got JSON there for the response object, turn the temperature down, then I can just check to see how that runs. It's done the chat GPT step. And then if we go back to our system, now we can see it's got some emojis. That's probably a little bit too many emojis in there. Um, and it's not really structuring it that nicely. So I might adjust that a little bit because it looks like it should be putting some line breaks in, but it's not. See, the actual output itself doesn't have line breaks in it. It's kind of used the emojis as line breaks. I do like how it's got the tags along the bottom there, all the hashtags. And then the Twitter one is nice and short, which is good. So I'm happy with that. And an, an important step that I actually missed on the uh, email one was that if you're going to use JSON as the output, you have to parse the JSON. And the reason for that is because the output of the JSON is actually just JSON text. It's, it's stringified JSON, right? And that's just how open AI deliver it. We have to then parse that out using the parse JSON module, which you can find under um, here. You just type in JSON and select the parse JSON module. Now, once we've parsed that out, well, then we can get the JSON values. If you just get the result, well, now you, you can't actually map the individual values in that JSON structure. You have to parse it first, and then you can map it into the right places. So I think this is okay, but I'm just going to add in use emojis and line breaks. Just put that specifically in there. It obviously thinks maybe because it's a social media post that it shouldn't use line breaks. So we'll see what we get now. All right, that's much better. So that's a much cleaner long form post, keeping in mind that this is going to be used for Facebook, LinkedIn for me. Um, you could ask it to create like Pinterest posts, Twitter posts, etc. This one here being Twitter being, what, 240 characters or so, that's probably about the right length. Pretty happy with how this is. Transform your content. Yep, benefits, maximize. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a great social post there. So happy with that. And now I would take that and go across to Buffer, schedule it out onto my different social platforms and have that post out. Now, I prefer to do that where I'm using an existing system. And I'm, for this, I'm just using the free version of Buffer. But I prefer to use Buffer to do the scheduling versus either doing the scheduling through make.com, which you can, or through bubble.io and sort of building my own Buffer scheduler. Because I like the fact that I have to manually take this data and put it into Buffer. I like the idea of that because it gives me a final step to check the data or someone to check the data uh, to make sure that we're not saying anything stupid in here, that the actual AI has done the right thing, that the right video has been linked, the transcript, you know, was existing, etc., and doing it manually before it goes out to the social media networks. I find that's much better. If they were charging a hundred bucks a month, well, I would bring it into here and figure it out. Now we've created our blog integration. This works on a similar concept as the social and the email integrations. However, this requires a little bit more tweaking because we're integrating this directly to WordPress. So how this works is we've got our blog here and we can create a new blog or edit an existing one. Then we can link it to a video like we can for the other functions. And you can see it loads up the video here and then we need to generate the blog. So I'll click generate blog here. And what that does is it then sends the data across into make. Let's have a look at how this functions. We've got the blog lookup that essentially tells us that the blog exists. And so then we can continue. If the blog doesn't exist for some reason, it just errors out there. Then we're looking up the video. If the video doesn't exist, then this will error out. Then we want to just filter to if the video has a transcript or not. Then we're setting the tone. I'm just keeping the same tone here from the previous scenarios, the social and email, that seems to be okay. And now for our call or our prompt to OpenAI, 
we're telling it that it's a blog expert, SEO expert, writing a blog based on the transcript. We're telling it to use HTML code for headings and also to embed the video at a width of 900 pixels. So we're being quite specific here because I want to really get a very consistent output from this API call. I'm telling it to write a thousand to 2000 words to give it a little bit of space to work with there. I'm telling it to add some emojis, which I think just breaks it up a little bit, letting it know which HTML code to use for the section headers. I think H2 should be fine right in this particular tone, which we're passing in from this step. And again, I'm just using the replace Integromat with make because a couple of the transcripts mention Integromat. So I want it to update it to the latest branding. Then the input is just simply the link to the video and then the raw transcript text. I've got the token count fairly high here at 3000. Uh, temperature turned down a little bit just to lose the roboticness and then sending the JSON object as the response. Then I am parsing that JSON. So parsing the string, which is returned from ChatGPT into an actual JSON object. And then I'm pushing that data directly to WordPress. Now I'm doing this here because I'm, I'm happy just to push it straight across. I might change the status. I could change the status to pending or draft. And then I could add a function in bubble to change the status of the blog and also push the updated data to the blog if I wanted to make changes. And that way I don't have to log into WordPress. I can just update it from bubble. So I'll set that status to draft and that way it exists. And now I can update it. I've mapped in the title of the content. I will later on map the featured image, which would require me to upload it first to my website and then map the ID of that upload here. I'm not worrying about categories or tags at the moment, although I could add that in fairly simply. I could even pull a list of the categories and tags from WordPress and then ask ChatGPT to add the correct tags or categories based on the transcript data. So I'll select a couple and it's probably a comma separated list, but you can see here, well, WordPress actually wants the IDs, the numbers and not the words. So I would need to feed into ChatGPT. Here's the word, his number return in this format just the numbers comma separated. That way I could then map that in to here. Then I'm simply writing with data back into bubble. And then from here, we can then edit it in our bubble page. Okay, so we've just run this through the logic and you can see the output here for the open AI. Uh, it used about 1500 tokens in total. And then the output's nice and clean. I've asked it to print HTML, so it's given me pretty reliable HTML here as the output. And the reason for asking for HTML is because now I can just pass it directly into WordPress and then it will print it in a nice sort of format for the page. The only thing I'll be changing here is the actual template of the page. So I'll probably leave the headline, maybe make it a little bit smaller or something, get rid of the previous next, get rid of this extra headline, which is copying that. And then you can see this is how it prints out on the page. And this is direct from the API call going straight to WordPress with no other processing other than telling it to print in HTML. And the point of this blog from a video is not really for people to read the blog itself, but more so so that the blog shows up in SEO and you get a bit of SEO traction on your website because you've got all these links to relevant pages that people are looking for in Google. And it's just another way for people to find that video to your YouTube. Now I don't want to write a blog, but this is sufficient and it covers everything that I've said in the video. So I think as a first path, it's pretty good. A little bit of cleanup here that, will, that I'll do in terms of the template and maybe in terms of the blog page, I'll add a function to update the blog. I think I'd be pretty happy with just sending all my videos through the API and then just having the blogs printed out and not having to edit them quite a lot. I'll have my editor as probably another step in this process drafted, edited, posted, something like that. Okay. So you may be thinking, well, this is great, but I don't want to record videos for my business. I don't have a YouTube channel. I don't want to have a YouTube channel. I don't want to be on the screen talking. That's fine. You don't have to do videos to use this system. You can simply use something like loom.com or any other audio recording system. And as long as you can capture a transcript of what you're saying of that video, you can then use that transcript 
in the social media and the email creation and the blogs. The benefit here is that the transcript is personalizing ChatGPT. It's basically giving it a training of that topic that you're talking about, rather than you just relying on whatever in ChatGPT and just saying, write me a blog post on make.com's top five features. That's a very generic output. And anyone can put that question into ChatGPT and get a very similar output. But if you're talking into a transcript and then you feed what you've said from that transcript into ChatGPT, it then pulls from that data and creates something highly personalized for your business, which means that it speaks in your own voice, speaks in your own tone, in your own brand, talks about things that you have already considered important in that transcript and repurposes it into a blog post for you. So you don't need to do video, but you do need a way to capture a transcript. I find it's much better to just talk and you can talk a lot faster than you can type. So being able to just talk into a loom for like two, three, four minutes, just do a full brain dump, not even in any sort of order, any sort of rhyme or reason, just dump everything in on a topic that you know, and then take the transcript and feed it into ChatGPT. ChatGPT will then take that fully unordered mess that you've created and extract and organize it all into a, a nice blog post. And uh, it will do that very reliably. So I highly recommend just, if you don't want to do video, just do Loom, do a transcript uh, or audio recording from Loom, capture the transcript. It will be much better than if you're just writing a prompt and feeding it into ChatGPT.